Are we ready? All right. Uh, just want to welcome everybody out to the uh, the technical advisory committee meeting. Um, be patient with me. Ben recruited me to do this just yesterday, wasn't it? Day before, maybe. Anyway, we'll get through this. So following along on the agenda, um, is there something before this I need to bring up, Ben? Anything? Or just go straight into the agenda? Yeah, into the agenda. But if you wouldn't mind reminding all with, if they want to speak, the use the mic, and then those online can participate as well. Oh, okay. So just to reiterate what Ben has said, if you want to uh, participate in the meeting here in the room, make sure you're turning your mic on. And for those who are participating online, same thing, unmute yourself and so we can all hear you. And we'll go from there. So we'll start out. The first thing on the agenda is the approval of the minutes for the March 27th, 2024 meeting. Um, do we have a motion to approve those minutes? I'll make a motion, Matt. Okay. Any wards to the city? Send that over. Brittany? Uh, let me, I'll we have a second? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a word. So it's from JUB. I'm okay. working for the county. I'll um, say, hey, Dennis asked me to find this. And maybe and if uh, they have questions, maybe you can call them and talk to them a little bit about it. What okay. I found. Am I missing something? Will do. I think that Dennis, is, I think you're. I was, I was exactly. kidding about the unmuting yourself until you're ready. I'm on it, Belinda. Do we get a second on the minutes? I didn't miss hear anything. I got it, Matt. John Miller, okay. Mill Creek. Oh, thank you. Okay, motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? If there is none, all in favor? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Um, and we have a guest with us today. Um, Brent, there you are. You're hiding over there, Brent Crowther. I'm going to review the comprehensive safety action plan that we just went through. Um, this is exciting stuff. I worked with Brent on one of our applications, so I'm excited to hear the things he has to share. So it's your time. Right. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to share with you the, the final comprehensive safety action plan. Um, this is a chart of fatalities and serious injuries across the United States uh, for the past uh, 10 plus years. You can see in the early, ten, in the early 2010s, we had about 30,000 fatalities in, uh, across the United States, and that's climbed up to more than 40,000 within uh, the past recent years. And it doesn't look like that trend is, is reversing anytime time soon. As a response to that, the Federal Highway Administration uh, sponsored uh, the what they call the Safe Streets and Roads for All program. It provides $5 billion over five years, beginning in 2022, uh, for jurisdictions to prepare comprehensive safety action plans or implementation projects within their jurisdiction. Wasatch Front Regional Council received uh, funding to prepare a safety action plan in the first round of funding in 2022. I'm here to report to you the results of that, that safety action plan. First, the, the purpose of our plan is to provide local governments the means to make strategic roadway safety improvements. Uh, the safety action plan meets all of the eligibility requirements that enable local jurisdictions to then apply for implementation funds. There are certain requirements uh, in order to be eligible for implementation funding, and this Wasatch Front Regional Council Safety Action Plan establishes those requirements for all of the jurisdictions within the WFRC region. The Final report is now available at WFRC.org. Then if you navigate to programs and then uh, go down below to the comprehensive safety action plan, you will see we have a streamlined executive summary of uh, 19 pages. And then we have a final report document that is uh, 50 or 60 pages or so. 
Um, and then we have a set of appendices that I will describe to you here in a few minutes. The Comprehensive Safety Action Plan addresses all of the requirements of the FHWA SS4A program uh, as listed. And we have one, one chapter that addresses each of the nine requirements. Today, we're going to deep dive a little bit more into the regional safety analysis and then the strategies and solutions and show you how this can be a resource for, for you to identify safety needs and then potential projects for implementation. Recognizing the, uh, the grandness of the WFSR, WFRC region, the 65 plus jurisdictions, uh, we divided the region into 11 geographic focus areas and did a separate safety analysis for each of the 11 geographic focus areas, which we refer to as GFAs. The safety analysis followed this framework. First, we looked at a comparison for each GFA of the frequency of fatalities and serious injuries within that GFA as compared to the ranking with the uh, Utah Strategic Highway Safety Plan. The next set of analyses identified trends uh, based on historical crash data. We did a statistical analysis uh, to identify segments and intersections with a higher than expected frequency of crashes than we would expect. And we also introduced a risk assessment process using uh, US RAP. We combined those analyses and identified these segments and intersections that uh, inform what we're calling our composite safety network. And that composite safety network represents a prioritized list of intersections and segments that responded to each of those safety analyses. They approximately represent the top 10% of safety needs within uh, the WFRC region. First, I'll share with you the results of that SHSP, Strategic Highway Safety Plan comparison. This chart shows, the, the second column shows each of the Utah Strategic Highway Safety Plan emphasis areas. Then the third column shows the frequency of fatalities and serious injuries that are categorized within each of those emphasis areas. We then ranked those uh, in terms of the frequency of fatalities and serious injuries. And as you can see here, intersections and roadway departure represent the number one and number two frequent emphasis area in terms of number of fatalities and serious injuries. That is consistent within each of the geographic focus areas as well with a couple of exceptions. Uh, you can see that in the East Weber, Morgan County, uh, intersections ranks way down the list at number eight, and we replace that with motorcycles. A couple other anomalies, you can see that in the uh, Salt Lake City and the Ogden geographic focus areas, uh, pedestrians uh, replaces, uh, emerges as a number two uh, most frequent occurring uh, emphasis area. Next, when we review our, our composite safety network, that is again based on historical crash trends, identifying each segment with three or more crashes. And then we did a statistical analysis to identify any segments or intersections that had higher than we would expect uh, frequency of crashes, which is referred to as a critical crash rate. We also introduced uh, using the tool US RAP as a data set maintained by uh, the University of Utah and the Utah Department of Transportation to identify risk factors on, on our, our street network. Individual segments and intersections that responded to that analysis were then advanced into our composite safety network. And those represent a broad set of safety needs throughout the network. Again, approximately the top 10% of safety needs within the WFRC region. This is an example of the, uh, the composite network. We identified uh, separately by uh, ownership, whether it's state routes, uh, federal aid routes is in blue, and the uh, local streets is in green, and the intersections is in pink. 
you can see a, a fairly wide network of safety needs within uh, this particular is a, a close up of the Sandy area. I'll show you in a second a map where you can look at all of those safety needs specifically within your jurisdiction. Recognizing the broad set of safety needs, we uh, prepared case study projects, identified up to three locations within each jurisdiction and advance those to what we are calling case study project locations. Again, it's not identifying projects on all of the safety needs, but it re represents uh, case studies that exemplify the types of projects that could be implemented uh, within the, the, the composite network on those identified segments and intersections to reduce the frequency of fatalities and serious injuries. This is an example of the, cre of the three case study projects that were prepared for within the, the city of, of Sandy. And you can see in the map, those are highlighted in blue. And then we assigned a case study project number to each of those case study projects. We prepared that analysis separately for each of the 11 geographic focus areas. And that is all uh, outlined in Appendix D of the Safety Action Plan. Uh, you can see uh, their Appendix D5 is the Salt Lake City GFA. Appendix D8 is the East Valley uh, Cities uh, as, as two examples. For each of those case study project locations, we prepared what we're calling project information sheets. We prepared three project, up to three project information sheets for each of those within each jurisdiction within the WFRC area. It represents a, a, a mix of whether it's state highways, local streets, or uh, federal aid routes. Tried to, to get a variety of project types. Uh, in consultation with uh, local jurisdictions. Many of you uh, attended our uh, workshops in February and March of this past year to provide input on those, on those locations. With that, uh, for each project location, has a detailing of the types of crashes that uh, are observed, and we recommend specific improvements as well as a planning level cost estimate. Those uh, Potential improvements are largely drawn from what we call the uh, proven safety countermeasures published by the Federal Highway Administration. They promote these, there's approximately 28 of these countermeasures in these categories uh, related to speed management, intersections, roadway departure, pedestrians, bicyclists, and cross cutting. Each year, FHWA adds a couple of these proven safety countermeasures as data becomes available uh, documenting their, their effectiveness. On March 28th, 2024, the, uh, Washington, Washington, the Regional Council adopted a safety commitment resolution uh, that included two goals. One is to reduce uh, frequency of fatalities and serious injuries by 50% by the year 2040. And the second is to, re, to achieve that goal to reduce the frequency of fatalities and serious injuries by 2.5% per year. The final report is available on the, on the website, wfrc.org, again, under programs and CSAP. And I'll just give you, if you'll go to that website, just a little uh, overview of where you can access uh, the tool. So this is uh, the project website. Again, if you click on programs and then comprehensive safety action plan, you'll scroll down. You can see there is our executive summary and our final report. And then below that, we have the appendices broken out for each of the geographic focus areas. Uh, appendix A, B, and C uh, are all the same. And then it's Appendix D that is broken out by geographic focus area. 
you can download that each appendice. It's about a hundred pages or so documenting the safety analysis and the, the recommended projects uh, for a little bit more accessible format to see this. If you scroll up to the top and you click on the uh, story map link, If you'll scroll down, each of the safety analyses that we, we perform, the results of that safety analyses are demonstrated within this story map. This first map is, is uh, a map of the region and the geographic focus areas. The second map is the case study project locations. And if you'll zoom in on that map, and just zoom in anywhere that you'd like there. You can see, you can navigate to your jurisdiction and see the, the case study project location that was prepared along with the ID number. And then you can also go into that, uh, the associated appendix, uh, find that ID number for the case study project and pull up that project information sheet. So hopefully that makes it uh, accessible and provides you uh, a good resource for a variety of funding sources, not only for the SS4A, but for capital improvement programs, for HSIP, uh, any other grant opportunities that you may be able to identify. Are there any questions that I can answer about the project or the deliverable? So Brent, these, this can be used on just about any of our future applications, right? This is not any of our future applications, right? This is correct. Is that me? That is correct. There are five five years of SS4A funding started in 2022. Uh, there are there's a 2024 round that we are currently in, and then there's a 2025 and 2026, and the criteria is that the action plan needs to be completed within, I think it was the last five years. And so this action plan satisfies that requirement for the next two rounds, 25 and 26, as well as the current round. So we have two more years, two more years. after this application. Correct. Okay. Yep. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yeah, please. Thanks. Uh, we would really love to encourage you to um, use these resources that have been prepared and look at the safety needs identified in your area. And like Brent mentioned, regardless of the funding source, whether it's city, county, state, WFRC, or other uh, federal funding source, uh, use these resources to help you either incorporate safety improvements into existing planned projects or uh, standalone safety projects. Can I add something? Yes, please. Thank you. I just wanted to go on record and thank Brent and his team for all of the hard work that they did on this project. The deadline for it got shortened several times and that didn't slow them down. And there's a lot of content and resources available to all of us on online. I mean, there's over a thousand pages in the report. Um, they handled a huge, huge amount of data and accident data that they went through in a very short timeline. Um, it's a great resource and it provides an interesting perspective, something that we're all a little bit not used to looking at from that type of perspective that will really help our funding applications come through. So they did a really great job. Thank you. We appreciate it. No, uh, I'd like to ditto that. It was it was fun to sit in on the committees and go through that in a sick sort of way. It was fun. So, and is that any more questions for Brent and his team? Um, and to also echo a little bit more uh, tail off of what Brittany has said, also to Wasatch Front for tackling this for the whole region um, and getting this comprehensive safety action plan completed. That was a huge, huge step up for from Wasatch Front, and uh, we we just we really appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brent. 
Okay, we'll uh, proceed on with our next item on our agenda. Ben, it looks like you're up. We have some uh, trans uh, tip business. All right. Well, first of all, on the agenda and thanks everyone for being here. We've got a board modification before us and we'll go through that here in a timely manner. Okay, great. So this board modification that we have is a request from West Jordan City. It's a project on 70th South and 1500 West. And maybe to familiarize you a little bit about the area, that project's located right in this location there on 70th South, right? Um, and there's an elementary school to the south, and it addresses this area that runs across the front of the school. This is the the school property and uh, the reason to bring that up will be we'll discuss here in just a minute. But there was a proposal to build a pedestrian crosswalk over 70th South and this was a project that came before this committee back in 2018 and you'll have an op. well you'll remember that we had the opportunity to discuss this project, the significance of it. So Heartland Elementary is the little elementary school to the south of this uh, particular facility there on 70th South. It's a Title I school. Title I schools tend to have a lot more walking traffic. Title I schools are those schools that are a little lower on the income. They also have other additional special needs programs or they have other opportunities or unique uh, situations that surround the school. And so we've got a very busy facility to the north along the whole front of this school property. So here's just a look, you know, have you ever noticed every time you want a picture where there's a lot of traffic, you go on Google Earth, and no cars are there. And when you don't want a car so you can see it, all the cars are there. So we got one kind of here in the middle, but the school property there, you can see to the left, and then you can see there's uh, the housing to the, the north of this facility, but a five lane uh, cross section on 70th South. So back in 2018, when this body here had the opportunity to review this project and make recommendations to Transcom, the intent was for a pedestrian crosswalk over 70th South and as the the TAC committee reviewed that, they recommended the full requested amount. Now the intent was to, on this project, they were gonna get a bridge. It was a surplus bridge that come off of Redwood Road. The city purchased that bridge with the intent that they would uh, reuse this facility and help with cost of the, of the, the project itself. Well, with everything that's been going on with the project, the engineering and all, it was identified that the engineer's estimate would now be 4.7 plus million. The old structure wasn't gonna work. It was gonna take so much retrofitting and that that it was gonna cost more than coming up and putting in a new facility. There was also a problem with geotechnical issues on either side that required the abutment or the foundations for the structure to be a lot larger than what was originally anticipated. Then we all know of the cost increase with construction and with inflation. So we had uh, the project current budget at 1.6 million. What that is, is that's the 1.4 plus million plus the local match. That gave us a total of 1.6 million. West Jordan went and, and checked the couch cushions. They did everything they could and they identified an additional 1.2 plus million initially for the project. Well, that still gives us only a total committed funds of 2.8 million, giving us a shortfall of about 1.9 plus million. Now, 
as I've been thinking about this project, and incidentally, this particular project last year, when the tip was out for public review and comment, we had, uh, Wayne slipped out. I don't remember what our total comments received on the tip were, but the majority of them were up in the Comptwood Canyons. Uh, the chair may have a recollection of that discussion that we've been having with Comptwood Canyons projects. Uh, but this particular project had the second most comments. It had 30 plus comments on a pedestrian crossing. No other project in the TIB had that kind of review and had that kind of comment on the needs for having something on this facility. And actually we're very fortunate that a little kid hasn't been hit or killed. So the request is for an additional 1.9 plus million dollars so that this project can move forward. They are in the ps and &E stage. There's a commitment from the city that they will go and they will continue to look for additional funding to reduce the impact on the STP program and that they will get this project advertised this fall so that things can move forward um, as quickly as possible when the project is ready. Nate, anything you would add? Yeah, thank you, Ben. And I really appreciate all your good good help and good work. That's a very good presentation and it, it, de it definitely represents the facts of the case. Um, it was the intention to use a, a bridge that we had acquired uh, that crossed 106 South in South Jordan, right next to Redwood Road. Oh, um, thank you. And so a big part of the uh, the first step of our, of our uh, design was to do an analysis of that bridge. And uh, this is this 70th South, is currently a five lane road, but it's scheduled to become a seven lane road. So we needed to design our, our project that could span seven lanes because within the next uh, eight to 10 years, 70 South will be widened to seven lanes. And the bridge just wasn't uh, structurally sufficient to do that. Um, the city, um, we have put in a lot of our own resources. We're, we've budgeted a, an, an additional million dollars for this upcoming budget year to help offset the cost of the bridge. And also, uh, in from one of the slides that you could see from Ben, uh, the north part, the north landing of the bridge, uh, the city has bought three lots out of that trailer park or that mobile home park for our, our bridge uh, landing and everything. Right there, you can see that. Um, and a big that big tan colored uh, area. There was three uh, uh, mobile homes on that location. We've bought those lots, demolished the mobile homes, and then on the south side, we've acquired the property from the school for this bridge for the for the stairways and landings and ramps to 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 be. So uh, we've already um, secured all of the right of way that we need. Uh, we've got the utility agreements. The PSNE review is scheduled for next month. And the, the project is ready to go to bid this this year. So uh, the only thing holding us back now is just the, the shortfall of money. So we're asking for the board modification to, to help us uh, make up that difference and, and that'll help us. And, and like Ben mentioned, it is a Title I school. Um, it's got a low income area. There's a lot of kids who walk to school for morning, uh, morning meals and uh, to and from school. So. Uh, the bridge would get used a lot and um, uh, definitely make it a, a much safer area for the air. And, and like Ben mentioned, there's been so many um, comments and, and requests from the school and the, and the families and the, the, the faculty that, that we're excited to get the project done, but uh, we are asking for the, the modification to, to help us get there. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Nate. Mr. Chair, that would be the board modification before the committee. Okay, and we're open for action for this? Yes. Sir. And remind us again what the dollar figure was? It is 1.9. 1. 1. We're getting there. 1.9. 1.9 1. 1. plus, yes. There okay. we go. All right. Uh, at this time, we'll entertain a motion for the modification to the 2024-2029 tip as outlined by... Uh, Ben, Mr. Wuthrich, motion. This is Keith at Midvale. I'll make that motion, Mr. Chair, to modify the tip um, for the 1.9 million plus 
for West Jordan's pedestrian bridge project. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second on the floor? This is Castle with Riverton. With I'll second. Okay. You're a little slow. You okay? Motion. Questions. I actually, have a question, Ben. Would you mind explaining where thou where those extra funds come from? If it's from past funding that wasn't spent, or if it comes out of future allocations. Perfect. Thank you, Brittany. So what happens, as you recall, we program out, the SDP program is programmed out six years. And so this past month, when we were recommending the new projects that we'll talk about in just a minute, those new projects are programmed for 2030. And then we've got projects in the queue from 2024, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. What will happen now on these funds is as we get project cost savings, which we're kind of in an environment where those are far, far less than what they used to be, but they still come in. What will happen is any project cost savings that come into the program get swept to the front of the, the programming. And then any projects that might be slow or not moving fast enough, we will push them back. So initially, this will impact projects that are currently programmed. We'll just slide back what's necessary back. It shouldn't slow any of them down. Unfortunately, we have yet to build everything we have programmed for the year that it's programmed. But what will happen is projects will get pushed back. We'll have these funds available for this project to move forward. And then we'll bring projects up again, back into their queue as funding's available. Does that help? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? And we'll call for the motion if there are no other questions. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Do we have any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you. And we'll move on to the next item, Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So let's see here. So that brings us in then to the preparation for the draft tip, the draft 25-2030 tip that'll move forward now to the transcom for public review and comment, or they'll give us a direction to release it for public review and comment. The intent of bringing this information to you before that is one, to make you aware of what's taken place up in the ogden Layton urban area, as we had opportunity this morning for them to become aware of what this body has done in the preparation of these draft projects or these projects for the draft program. Then to make you aware and to request from you any information or, or any recommendations to Transcom outside of us not requesting uh, permission to move forward with public review and comment. So real quick, what I wanted to remind you then is the schedule. You'll recall that back in September, we had that letters of intent request in preparation. Then we had the project evaluation concept reports, which are generally do the mid part of December. And then we begin the evaluation process from that point up through the end of March. That includes conversations with the project sponsors. That includes field reviews. And that includes a road show where we go through all the projects together as a committee. And then we come in in March where you make those recommendations that move forward. I'm pleased to report to you that Transcom uh, received your recommendations and made those recommendations to the regional councils that those projects be programmed as recommended by the TAG committee. So, I wanted to, these are the projects that you hadn't seen up in the ogden Layton urban area. So for your, uh, just a, a review there, the Wasatch Front area goes all the way to the north side of Brigham City and then comes all the way down to Utah County. The ogden Layton urban area goes from the north side of Brigham City down to the Salt Lake boundary. And so in the ogden Layton urban area, we had a total of 51 projects, totaling more than 446 million in total project cost. 31 of those projects were requesting STP funds, 110 million plus of STP funds. 
We had 8.5 million available there, but made an adjustment in the program that gave us 10.5 million available in the Ogden Layton area. Six projects were CMAC, eight TAP, and six uh, were the carbon reduction program. Then for just a, a reminder there in the Salt Lake area, we had 58 projects, totally more than 583 million with the 30 requesting STP funds, 11, 10, and seven. So we went through the exercise with both of the TAC committees. You'll recall that we had these evaluation sheets for all of the programs, the STB, the CMAC, the TAP, and the CRP programs. We were able to go through the ones that are highlighted in yellow. Those were the recommendations from the TAC committee. Now the paper that you had before you, and did we send that out to the folks online, Rosie? So after the slideshow. So for the folks that are online, we've got a summary page of all the projects we'll show in just a minute for each of the programs. These are the new projects that'll be programmed into the draft programs for the draft tip. Um, we had seven projects in the STP program up in the Ogden Layton area that told the 10.5 million available. I might point out too, we didn't, there are drinks in the fridge. There's drinks there, there's water there, and then there's cookies on the counter. Please feel free to, those online, if you drive real quick, we'll save you. But anyway, back, we've got seven projects, totaling more than 10.5 million in the Ogden area, 12 projects in the Salt Lake area. So the sheets that we'll be sending those online, this is what they look like. And the ones here in the room, they have a hard copy. So the seven projects in the Ogden Layton area totaling the 10.5 are listed here. The Salt Lake ones are on the back of that page and they are listed here totaling the 24.3 plus million. Now to give you an example of the projects in, uh, we took one here in the Ogden Layton area. This is a project that's actually located in the Bountiful. This is the old Bamberger Bridge or they call it park and overpass. This facility has long lived its life. It's worn out, it needs to come down. Underneath you have very narrow lanes where the, the four lanes of traffic go underneath the structure. You can see that tight fit. But you also have ponding and we have issues with drainage on this facility. The intent is to take this structure out. Now, if you were to look on an aerial there, there it is crossing diagonally there's a lot of traffic movement through that area. And the problem is, is that if you take it out, you eliminate a lake of traffic or you rebuild it. But then the region worked together with Bountiful City and they identified that if we brought everything up to the same level, we could build an at grade full intersection with the signal and that would actually help I, with the traffic problem to one of the high schools that's there to the west. This is Woods Cross High that's to the west of where this intersection is located. So the TAC committee reviewed all this information. It was requested at 3.5 million. The TAC recommended 2 million. Transcom reviewed that, recommended to the council, and the council approved the $2 million for that project. We won't go through all of them like that, but to give you an idea, what they're looking at, as well as a couple of these projects are ones that you reviewed. In the congestion mitigation air quality program, we had three projects recommended up in the Ogden Layton area, 4.4 plus million. Salt Lake was 6.8 plus million of five projects recommended. The table for the CMAC are all on one side, the Ogden Layton projects on the top, Salt Lake urban area on the bottom. So, the project that we illustrated the, in the CMAC was actually a project that you re reviewed and recommended. This was on the roundabout. Well, it's an intersection project recommended to take this at, at uh, grade three-legged intersection and create a roundabout in this area. We reviewed this picture of how congested it is when there's activities up. This intersection's just east of Hogel Zoo. And so with the intent to build a roundabout in this area, it reduces the air quality, um, it improves the air quality, it reduces the congestion, 
It improves the speeds. It also improves safety in the area. You recommended this project. You recommended the 762,000. We took that to Transcom. They reviewed and recommended. Council approved the 762,000 for this project. So then we go into the TAP program or the Transportation Alternatives Program, five projects in both urban areas for the amount that we had available to program. The table on that is the Ogden Layton is listed on one side of the page with the Salt Lake projects listed on the back. Yes, Rosie. Everyone online should have the link to the spreadsheet now. Oh, awesome. So everyone online, you should have a copy of these sheets. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks, Rosie. So a project then that we highlighted there was another project that this body reviewed and approved. This a project that was in Mill Creek. This is a project that's located there. Um, it's a crosswalk PED facility on 27th East at 3776 South. Um, from this angle, the project looks terrific. But you get down to ground level and you see that you've got a significant crown on the road. And then the one side, you've got um, no shoulder there and you drop off the pavement. And then on the other side, you've got a, a catwalk that has several steps that you have to navigate through before you can get down to the sidewalk. And then at the base of the sidewalk, at the base of the, the ramp, you have ponding whenever there are storms making it pretty hard for any pedestrian to facilitate or use this facility. You reviewed this project and you recommended the full requested amount. Again, Transcom took that recommendation, reviewed it and recommended to the council and it was approved. So then our last program was the carbon reduction program. And this is two projects in the Ogden Layton area, three projects in the Salt Lake area. Ogden Layton, we had 1.8 to program Salt Lake, we had 2.4 plus. Again, those projects are listed on a single side of the sheet on the back side of the CMAC program. And those projects, the one that we'd like to highlight then is a project up in far west. This is a project that was recommended. This takes a four legged intersection that has a lot of traffic, especially large truck traffic and creates a roundabout. The intent there is to build a roundabout, but if for some reason that doesn't work, then to go in with a full signalized intersection. Uh, the TAC recommended funds that were available, that was 900,000. That amount was presented to Transcom. They reviewed and recommended to the council. And again, the council approved all these last Thursday for the draft programs. So that is what will be part of the draft program that's going out for public review and comment as directed by Transcom. Transcom will make that motion in June. We'll go out the 29th of June and then conclude on the 3rd of August. We'll have two public open houses, one at the intermodal up in uh, the Ogden Lane area and then one here at the intermodal center in Salt Lake. Uh, appreciate the UTA accommodating us there. Alma does a lot of help there to help us get those organized. Any questions on anything of the tip? Or I did forgot to mention that we have the draft air quality conformity uh, determination has also been prepared and that will be out for public review and comment as well. Mr. Chair, that would be all that I have. Oh. I think you've got plenty to share, Ben. So much knowledge. We're here to learn from you. <laughs> um, so we'll move on to our next item on the agenda. It is UDOT Region 2 workshop. I'm assuming this is from Kendall. Is that? Yeah. Okay. One sec. I'm just. Oh, there you are. Are you able to see that all right in the room? Yes, we are. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you guys for letting me be here and kind of give you an update. Um, what I plan on updating today is going over what our construction season looks like for this year, some of those major projects that are going on, and then also showing you a little bit about our STIP application where anyone at the cities could go see 
what we have planned for the future inside your areas. So to start with the first area that I wanted to kind of talk about is our capacity projects. These are our major road widening projects. Um, you can see on the map where they kind of look across the valley. valley. Um, the first is on SR-68 at 6200 South at the I-215 area. We've been adding a northbound lane and modifying the signal at 6200 South. We're anticipating the completion of this this summer. And then we also have um, the Bangator Highway South interchanges. This is 2700 West, 134 South, and 98 South that's going on currently. This is in, anticipated to be completed next fall in 2025. Along with that, we also have the interchange at Bangator Highway at 47th where the new interchange is going in with the completion anticipated in the fall of 2025 as well. Um, then we have the I-15 or I-215 frontage road. This is at 41st South to 4700 South at that off ramp that is being converted into a frontage road with the off ramp moving back um, towards in between the state building and the UDOT building that is there. And that's currently under construction with an anticipated completion this next spring in 2025. And then we have 90th South that is under construction from Redwood Road to 700 um, West. This is widening that roadway section to a seven lane section with anticipation that this will be complete next fall. So these are the capacity projects that UDOT has going on this year for construction. Um, you can see that most of these are found in the west side of the valley. Um, the next I wanna go over is all of our structure projects. And you can see by the map right now that we have a lot of need to repair structures. And you'll see by the dots on the screen, the number of structures that are under um, construction activities this year. Um, we have 19 bridges along I-80, Bangator Highway and Redwood Road that will be under um, preservation where we're doing pothole patching and new membranes on the structures and new overlays. Then we also have an I-15 23 bridge decks from 300 North to 114th South that will also be doing pothole patching and um, thin bonded overlays. And then we also have on I-15 Northbound between 21st and 1,000 uh, yeah, South, six structures that will be repairing joints and that's both sides of the structures that will be having that. It's anticipated that all three of those um, structure projects on I-15 and I-80 will be complete the fall of 2024. And then we have a large um, deck rehabilitation on SR-201 at 3200 West, where we'll be doing a deck replacement and girder repairs. Um, this is anticipated to be complete the spring of 2025. This will have a major closure of um, 3200 West underneath that structure as this is being repaired for about a five to six month period. And then the final structure one that I wanted to highlight is it's currently under construction at 700 West, 300 West and tracks that goes over I-215. They're rehabilitating um, those structures there. Right now it's anticipated that that will be complete the fall of 2024. And then the final is just all of the other projects that we have going around the region. I'm not gonna go through all the listed projects. I just wanna make sure that if any of you have questions about those, you can reach out to me. I'm more than willing to give you any more details, timelines. I just wanna make sure that you know what's planned from the region for our 2024 construction season. Uh, most of this work on this list is preservation um, pavement, but we do have some um, lighting and signal improvements that are going around the whole valley. Um, this summer. With that being said, if you ever want to know anything about UDOT's programs, what projects are out there, what we're planning on doing, you can always go to our STIP app. And I have a link here in the presentation. And it's going to take a second to load and I'll share this. So when you log in, you'll be able to see you can filter on region two. And you can start seeing whatever type of project you want to look for. If it's a pavement project, right now I've got it filtered on all pavements. You can go what's being proposed for future years. You can go look at what the commission has already approved for us to do. 
you can see what's in design right now. You can see what's out to construction for those pavement projects. And then if you want to see a table of those as well with one pagers that explain what is happening in detail on that. And it's going to take a second to pop up. And they look like this, where each project gives you some summary about what's happening on it, timelines, what's going on. So you can find information about those projects. So hopefully you've all seen that STIP app before. That's one of the best ways to find out about what projects are planned, what our programs look out for future year. You can see when we're planning on starting construction for those projects. You can look at what MPO projects are also on there for Wasatch Front. You can see everything that is found as part of the STIP with UDOT. Um, that's the presentation I had. Any questions on any of the UDOT projects that are going on this season or anything about future projects that you guys would like to know about? Hey, uh, Kendall, uh, Trey with Murray City. Uh, I have a question for you regarding um, I-15, uh, primarily okay. in the southbound direction. Um, I, I drive that daily from Murray to South Jordan. And there are some there's some serious potholing going on in that that road, multiple lanes, big chunks of concrete out, um, a lot of pavement damage. Um, I, I see it daily. I'm not seeing that project being addressed in a in a maintenance project, at least from what you've presented. Um, are you guys aware of how bad that's getting? And is there plans to? do some maintenance on that. I, I can see you're doing the bridges, which big chunks of concrete missing from around the bridges, but this is beyond the bridges. Uh, this is in travel lanes. And it's, I mean, it's getting pretty, pretty crazy out there. So I will show you, um, we do have some proposed projects. It's not this year, but we do have proposed projects next year from 106 to 90 South redoing um, pavement rehabilitation on I-15. So doing panel replacements and a grind through that section. And then we also have another section coming in the future from 53rd to 72nd. So we do have in the next two to three years plans on I-15 in that south end of the valley. I don't know how far yours goes uh, of the concern. That's where I'd have to get with you and know the exact end, but I do know that our pavement is planned to have some treatments going on in the next few years. I know our maintenance is trying to fill and hold some of those things together as we speak. Yeah, it, it needs some some asphalt pothole filling or some mastic. It's pretty serious out there. I you know I drive it every day and I get a look and and, and see how bad the potholing's getting. You know, uh, I hope it makes it through another winter or two. Um, boy, you get plows on that um, without some some serious work. I don't know that it's going to hold together. I, I mean, it's it's getting to the point where it could be dangerous. Uh, it could be causing, I, I see it actually causing flat tires quite often, uh, but it could get worse than flat tires out there. But uh, it's good to know something's in the works. It's just holding it together until next year and until 2027. Um, that's a long time to yeah, how far so south would, did you say, Trey, that you thought it went to? Um, well, I drive from 45th to, you know, 114, but um, I'm I'm guessing the worst is 53rd to 106th. Um, I see it in both directions, but uh, definitely more in the southbound because I'm, I'm traveling that in the evenings and I'm moving slow. So I get to see and dodge literally dodge all the potholes in the damaged concrete. Um, it's it's crazy, you know, broken windshields and flat tires. Uh, I'm seeing that um, even on my personal vehicle, but I'm learning where a lot of them are and how to miss them. Um, but it's, it's kind of, I, I think it's getting to the point that it's causing safety issues out there. So anything you can do to add some asphalt and fill in those holes and, you know, keep the pavement from crumbling would be, would be great. Um, no, I, I, don't will, see uh, a, I don't see a lot of that going on, 
Um, I just see bigger and bigger chunks coming out of the potholes as I drive by and dodge them, you know, every evening. No, I'll pass that along to our pavement engineer and to our maintenance and see, I know that they were looking to adjust some of the things on I-15 in timelines, but I know the next three years we do have plans for rehabilitation along I-15 in chunks. So I, it is on our radar. Now, if I can do it earlier, that's a, a question for our pavement and our funding, but I do appreciate it. And I'll pass this along to the pavement engineer, along with our maintenance folks. Thanks, Kendall. I appreciate it. And no worries. Thank you, Kendall. We appreciate it. Um, and a final item on the agenda for this afternoon is Draper. Uh, Eric Lundell is going to present a little bit about your city. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. So this is a project we've just done recently that was kind of a little unique and, and had had some interesting constraints. And so I thought it'd be a, a good thing to share with you guys. And we just completed this this last fall. Um, it's a roundabout and reconstruction. At, and it's at, um, it's at 1300 East and Pioneer Road. Uh, both of these roads, one is a minor collector, the other is a major collector. Um, identified in our master transportation plans. Um, they're failing in both the east and west bound directions and we're operating at levels of service E and F. We had a bunch of traffic studies that were done um, at going back to 2012, well before I was with the city that they've evaluated this a bunch of times, um, looking at ways to improve the level of service um, worked with different consultants. Um, a lot of this I wasn't involved with, but I've had a chance to go back and look at some of these studies, uh, adding, adding dedicated turn lanes for the east and westbound direction to have their own lane to drive into, uh, removing the roundabout and putting a, a signalized intersection, uh, a metered roundabout is something they looked at just to give enough gap to, to get vehicles in. Um, some of the project constraints, there's, it's really high volumes coming through there. Um, the city council wanted us to, to keep it open to at least some traffic as we were constructing it. Um, some of the other constraints with traffic is just, just to the west of on Pioneer Road is the last blue line stop. Um, and UTA has bus routes that come through and then they use the roundabout to, to flip a UE as well as IFA is right right just there to the west as well um, that we're using the, the roundabout to get in. They'd come in one direction and come out uh, headed eastbound. Um, and then some of the businesses around here. Another issue, um, you can see a map here with the golf course in Sandy. This whole area in yellow, oops, sorry. This whole area in yellow is pretty much constrained. That's their only access out. There's no connection right now with Sandy. Um, so all these homes up here, the only way, and there's there's a lot of them. I didn't count how, how many. It, they can come through here, through this kind of this blue line, but that's a it's kind of an old draper, very narrow roads. The turning radius, radiuses wouldn't permit emergency vehicles, some of our bigger fire trucks. Um, and with the wildland urban interface, that was a concern to, to shutting this road down. Um, so what we ended up doing, um, so ultimately we decided that we needed to, to close the intersection, kind of take the pull off the bandaid approach and just get it done really quickly. And we had support with the council who said, if we can get it done in, in three weeks, can, you know, they were on board with us closing the intersection down. So we punched through a road um, right there at the border with Sandy on, on Draper Parkway. Um, a lot of people actually wanted us to keep that road open, but obviously the residents on that road uh, di didn't feel the same. And, and we've since closed that road up. If, if we didn't make that connection, the detour for some of these homes over here, there's a, a, a Walmart 
uh, market up here. It was a three and a half mile detour just to get, if you're coming from here, just trying to get here. So it's it pretty significant. And uh, to be able to punch through that road temporarily uh, is really what, what made it possible to, to close the road. The, the project went through, um, we had a consultant, um, Joe Perrin and Bill Baranowski help in the design. Um, kind of went through three iterations. The, the overall design stayed the same, but initially before, before I took, took over this project, it, it went out to bid as just a mill and overlay and patchwork. Um, and that came in way higher than they were anticipating because of the amount of traffic control. And so that was intended to keep the intersection open. And then we had a consultant approach us and a, a contractor approach us and want to do a rapid set. And they said, we're going to do it for you basically at cost. And we want this to be kind of the, the staple so we can get other cities on board and we can point to this project. And then when push came to shove in the bid, they partnered with somebody else and the bids came way higher than basically what they were, that we were expecting. And so we scratched it again and then just went with a full depth replacement. We also included the North Lake all the way up to, to uh, Draper Parkway or 123rd South um, and replacing all that pavement on that third iteration. And you can see kind of what the bids came, came in there for it um this is this will take way too long but so what ended up taking six days and included removing those islands widening on all but this this leg to the left of you which is the the southwest leg is the only place we didn't rip out curb and gutter um when we did the that second iteration we were heavy on damages and it seemed like the prices went way up like, Oh, we know we're not going to meet this. So we're just going to inflate our prices to pay for those damages. So on that third iteration, we went heavy on incentives um, and ended up working out really good for us. There were some unex unexpected complications. We had a, I can't remember like 493 year storm. It was, just under two inches in an hour. Um, it flooded out a bunch of stuff. It was on the news. And that was just before they're about to pave the north half. So they got some weather days there. They would have done it in that two week time frame, which was the full incentive. Um, uh, soft spots everywhere we had those islands. There had been leaking sprinklers forever. We had to kind of adjust on the fly to to bridge those and then traffic control. Uh, I'm sure everybody deals with it, but everybody just kept moving the traffic control and driving straight through. So that was kind of a, a difficult thing for us. We also had a event center that's just right there on the corner that that had some needs that needed to be met to keep access open for them. Um, so this is kind of before construction where we just had one you know, north and southbound had a dedicated right only and then through. So we kind of narrowed up the north and south islands and then widened out the east and west islands. So it's two lanes north and south through now. And then we have the, the dedicated right that has allowed for some queuing for the people trying to pass all the way through uh, there on the right. Um, we do have continued issues with it. If if you know that road coming southbound on 1300 East is a pretty steep grade. Um, so we've been working at, you know, peep, it's, you know, advisory speed at 15 miles per hour. And we're getting the 85th percentile, at like 34 <laughs> coming into that. And it's, I think, 20 accidents in like the first, I want to say four months. Um all of our RRFBs, almost every one's been hit. And you can see here, cars will just not stay in their lane. We've been doing what we can. You can see this white car just decide to go over. And then, let's see here. And then this one, just people fell, failing to yield. Um, 
So that's that's been a an issue. There's lots of signage up, um, but it was overall it was a very successful project. Um, training people to use roundabouts. There, fortunately, all these accidents have been you know low impact because of the angle in which they're they're hitting. But just people failing to yield and going through it too fast. And we've we've gathered all those traffic. Uh, those accident reports and it's primarily north south doing basically what you saw in that last video but overall it was a really successful project and done in a really tight time frame um, and we were really happy with with the outcome we got even though it took a long time to get there um, that's all I have if you have any questions This is uh, Bill Bernowski, and um, I'm excited to hear the, about this project that I worked helped work on. Um, so co coming down the hill, oh, and next to me is uh, my old boss, who used to be at Draper, Nate Nelson. We built this back in was it 2000? We it was built. So it was built for expandability. Um, so. We the reason we didn't put a crosswalk on this southbound entrance is because of the steepness and the speeds coming down the hill. I think we need that needs to be looked at a lot more in the future. I that, there's a lot of options to make that to slow down that traffic. Maybe even a, like a raised crosswalk. Yeah, and we bet we actually met with Joe Perrin about. So he he worked with LTAP to get these videos, and he's still analyzing those, but. We're looking at some flashing yield signs, yeah. possible rumble strips. Um, yeah, the crosswalk, I don't know that we want to do, but that's definitely well, something maybe we, a maybe we have a, a hawk maybe a crossing. Speed bump. Maybe a yeah. speed bump or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. so we definitely want to look at all of our options, but it has been an issue just trying to slow people down and, and just pay attention, which with in today's world with distracted drivers, that's becoming increasingly difficult. One one thing we did different on this project, if you go back to that picture, is uh, all the stripings 12 inches wide instead of the usual six, four to six inches. So it's really stands out. So I, to keep, yeah, we it, really, it definitely stands out. When I first went out there, I was like, whoa. <laughs> and it, like I said, another engineer was heavily involved. You're involved with Todd, with Todd Hammond when he was still here mm -hmm. with the city. Um, but yeah, it stands out and I think it's, it's really good. So I think that part came out again. So we're worried about people crossing over in the circle. Not so much. We didn't really focus on the yielding at the entry. So that's, that kind of was a surprise. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and I believe that concludes, uh, all the items on the agenda. Just a reminder, Harriman City, are you around? You're up next at the next meeting for presentation and refreshments. So, and with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? Is that how that, or do we just get up and walk out? Motion to adjourn. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll move to adjourn. Do I have a second? Move, move and a second. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Oh. A second. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time.